In this video we will discuss parallel transport or affine connections between uh, uh, tangent spaces at different points and their relation to covariant derivatives and uh, geodesics. In fact, we will uh, make an attempt in this and uh, in the next video to show that uh, those concepts are very closely connected and uh, they are in general relativity uh, equivalent to each other. So let's start in a formal way and define what we mean by a derivative operator in a manifold. This will be a map between uh, uh, tensor fields of type KL to tensor fields of type KL plus 1. That means their uh, contravariant uh, type is increased by 1 by the derivative operator. And uh, such an operator is a derivative operator or a covariant derivative uh, if it has uh, the following properties. First of all, it is linear, it acts linearly on uh, linear combinations of tensor fields of the same type. Then if we have tensor fields of, uh, uh, sorry, if we have tensor products of tensor fields T and S, uh, this is written down in the abstract index uh, notation, uh, then the derivative operator acts on this tensor product uh, in a way that generalizes the Leibniz rule of uh, ordinary derivatives. Furthermore, the action of the operator must commute with contractions. In order to understand this equation here, let's explain in more detail what it means. On the left-hand side, we have a KL type tensor where we have contracted two indices, one upstairs and one downstairs, giving us a tensor field of type k-1, l-1. Then we act with the derivative operator and we obtain a tensor field of the type k-1, l. On the right hand side, first we take the covariant derivative of t, giving us a k, l-1 tensor, and then we contract the respective indices, the ones that we have chosen also on uh, the left-hand side of this equation, and we obtain also a tensor field of uh, uh, type k minus 1 L. In order to start building up how this uh, derivative operator acts on tensor fields, we have to put uh, uh, the grounds and define what it means to act on uh, ordinary functions. So if we have a function f on the manifold, then the action of any such covariant derivative operator should be the same as that of the gradient. If we choose a vector field v and we contract the index of the operator mu here with the index mu of the vector field, then the result should be the same as the vector field v acting on f. A condition that is, uh, uh, it is assumed to hold in uh, ordinary general relativity uh, is that uh, this operator has also the torsion-free property. That means that if we take any function on the manifold, then the action of uh, uh, the derivative operators here has a commutator that is equal to zero. And that means that if we first, first act with d nu on f and then with d mu, then this is the same as first acting with d mu and then with d nu. This uh, property is not assumed in uh, many extensions of uh, general relativity or in other geometric theories. And uh, if it doesn't hold, then we will soon see that the difference of uh, the left-hand side from the right-hand side is given by uh, the action of a one, two tensor field which is called the torsion tensor. Let's discuss an important property that uh, a derivative operator has uh, if, it, uh, if we postulate the properties that we have uh, just described. If we take uh, the contraction of uh, the derivative of uh, uh, two tensor fields with the other tensor field, having first 
v times dw minus w uh, dv, then this is equal to the commutator of the two vector fields. Let's see this because this is uh, an important property, uh, why this is true. Let's take the right hand side and uh, uh, since this is a vector field as we know, uh, it is defined by its action on an arbitrary function on the manifold. And uh, we can compute this action by the definition of the commutator. First, w acts on f. It gives us another function here where the vector v acts on it. And the second term comes with a minus sign, and those two operations are taken in the reverse order. First, we act with v on f, and then with w on the result. But from the definition of the derivative operator, the action of a vector field on a function is the same as the contraction of the vector field with uh, the derivative of f. And that gives us another function. And uh, we can uh, also apply uh, this property, that's property 4 in the previous slides, uh, once more. And uh, we obtain uh, v, uh, v nu times d nu uh, on uh, d mu on uh, w mu d mu and then uh, the second term has uh, a similar action of the derivative operator but in the reverse order but now we can apply property 3 the Leibniz rule on this product here and uh, we have two terms coming from it first the derivative um, uh, acts on uh, w mu and gives the first term here and then it acts on the d mu f and gives us here the uh, second derivative of f and similarly we have uh, uh, similar terms coming from the second term here now uh, let's try to do a, li a little bit of elementary algebra uh, notice here that we uh, sum over the indices new and new here so these are dummy indices and uh, we can uh, change their names to be whatever we like so let's rename new to be new and new to be new and uh, what we will obtain is uh, w, w mu here and v new there which is the same as uh, the uh, factor here in this term which can be taken to be here as a common factor. Now, if this is taken as a common factor, the result here in the parenthesis is equal to zero because we have assumed that uh, uh, the derivative operator is torsion free. So this term vanishes and we are left only with the first term here. But uh, if you look closely, uh, the term here in the parenthesis is a vector field and uh, it uh, contracts here with d mu, therefore uh, we know from uh, the definition of the action of the derivative operator on, uh, on functions that this is nothing but the action of this vector field on f. So if v, if the, the commutator v at w on any f is equal to this vector field acting on f, that means that this vector field and this vector field are equal to each other. And therefore, we have proven that this uh, equation is true. Now, let's discuss a little bit the partial derivative. The way we will look at it here is slightly different than uh, most of the bibliography. We will take the point of view of the book by Walt. Uh, in that book, d mu is uh, seen as uh, a derivative operator that is, uh, of course, defined only in a coordinate system, so only defined in the chart of that coordinate system, but still uh, it has all the properties that the uh, covariant derivative operator has. Let's see how we can take this point of view and why it is useful. First of all, pick a coordinate system with a, in a chart U here, uh, that uh, defines a coordinate basis d mu and uh, 
a basis of one forms dx mu. Now take any tensor field defined on the manifold and restrict it in the coordinate uh, chart here u and let's define the vector the tensor field d mu t which by definition is the one that has components in u that are equal to the partial derivatives of the components of t that defines a tensor because that allows us of course with uh, uh, to use the transformation law for components of tensors to compute the components of that tensor in any other co uh, uh, coordinate system so by d mu t we denote this tensor here and we see that the operator d mu satisfies all axioms of a covariant derivative but we have to be careful i mean first of all d mu t is defined only in the chart u furthermore if we choose a different chart u prime with coordinates x mu prime and uh, coordinate vectors d mu prime then uh, we have a different covariant operator d mu prime which is not the same as d mu and d mu prime acting on t gives us a different tensor field on the intersection of u and u prime i mean uh, taking this definition here d mu prime t is the tensor field whose components in u prime are uh, the derivatives of uh, the components of t uh, differentiated with respect to x mu prime Usual textbooks uh, say that d mu t is not a tensor field because it does not transform as one. But in uh, the point of view that we take here, we have defined d mu t to transform as a tensor. If we take this point of view, however, d mu t and d mu prime t are not related. They are different tensor fields. And this is true only if we use the abstract index notation. We will soon see that uh, a covariant derivative on a manifold is not unique. There are an infinite number of them. So what we want to see is how different derivative operators are related on a manifold. In general relativity, however, we will see that there is a unique torsion-free derivative operator that, given a metric, is compatible with the chosen metric. And by compatibility, we mean that the metric is left invariant uh, by the action of the derivative operator. And in general relativity, we postulate that this particular derivative operator is relevant for the physics of general relativity. But from a geometric point of view, we can have many connections, and which one we choose depends on uh, the problem that we are considering. If we have two different such covariant derivative operators, d and d tilde, then their difference is a tensor field. And this is not as trivial as it looks like, as we will soon see, but it is true. First of all, when the difference d minus d tilde acts on functions, this is by definition equal to zero. Because as we said, all covariant derivatives acting on functions should equal to the gradient of the function. So this is equal to zero. What we will show here is that when this difference acts on tensor fields, the result is not zero anymore. But the difference is given by a 1, 2 tensor field, which is uh, contracted with uh, uh, the differentiated uh, vector field x. In order to show this, we have to uh, see a special property that uh, the difference of those uh, derivatives have. If we have a tensor field x and we consider the vector field f times x for any function f, then when this difference acts on f times x, the result is f multiplying the difference of uh, those derivatives acting on x. So, and this is true only because uh, the action of those derivatives of functions is uh, independent of the derivative operator. 
So now what we will show is that d minus d tilde x uh, is a uh, tensor field because it depends only on the value of the vector field at the point P and not at neighboring, uh, not at its values at neighboring points of P. That means that if we take any other vector field such that its values at the point P coincide with that of x, then d minus d tilde acting on W at the point P is equal to d minus d tilde acting on x at the point P. And of course this relation for different vector fields is valid only at the point P. The reason why such relation holds is because the difference of W minus X is also a vector field. And if we consider the values of this difference in neighboring points of P, then at each, uh, at each such point, uh, this gives us a vector and uh, such vector can be um, written down as a linear combination of the basis at, uh, of the tangent space at that point. So at each point here we have a linear combination with constant coefficients and if we repeat this for all neighboring points in the neighborhood of P we obtain uh, this linear combination here where F now depends on those points therefore it is a smooth function. But this difference vanishes at the point P therefore those functions should be such that they vanish at the point P. So if we compute this difference here, that means d acting on w minus x and d tilde acting on w minus x, then this will be equal to uh, the right hand side shown here where we have substituted uh, this difference here. And uh, because of the linear property of uh, those derivative operators, uh, this is equal to the action of d minus d tilde on f times u at each point. But we have shown this property here, equation 1, that when d minus d tilde acts on f times u, this is f uh, times du minus d tilde u. Since those functions f alpha here are such a, that they vanish at P, that means that this difference here vanishes at the point P. And the left hand side here is equivalent to equation 2 written here. So we have shown equation 2. Therefore, the action of d minus d tilde on vector fields is a linear map of vectors at the point P to 1, 1 tensors. But this is exactly what defines a 1, 2 tensor at the point P. And since we can repeat this process for any point P, that defines a 1, 2 tensor field over the whole manifold. So uh, we can express this uh, because of the linearity of the action of d minus d tilde on x as a 1, 2 tensor field uh, contracted with uh, the vector field x uh, with respect to the index row there. So this is a definition here that comes because of this property. Having this at hand, we can see how the action of d minus d tilde uh, is defined on any other tensor field. And let's start with one form fields. If omega is such a one-form field, then if we take the contraction of omega with x, that gives us a function, which means that d minus d tilde acting on that function should be equal to zero. We apply the Leibniz rule, and we see the first term here, with d minus d tilde acting on omega, is what uh, we are looking to compute. And uh, the second term here, d minus d, d, d tilde acting on x, is something that we have already computed in the previous slides. So we can substitute what we have computed before in terms of the 1, 2 tensor field C. 
and uh, in order to get rid of this uh, arbitrary tensor field uh, vector field x we rename the indices a little bit we take the dummy indices new here that are summed over and the row they're also summed over and uh, we uh, change their names new is changed to row row is changed to new and we see that uh, x new here is a common factor and gives the contraction of uh, this uh, one to tensor field on an arbitrary uh, vector field x therefore if this contraction for any x is equal to zero it means that the tensor field is equal to zero therefore we can solve for d omega and that can be written down as d tilde omega minus c contracted with omega and compare this with the formula that we have uh, derived for vector fields and uh, look at their similarities and differences first of all there is a difference in the sign here the plus sign that we had for vector fields becomes a minus sign and uh, we see that indices are summed in a different way so that uh, upstairs and uh, uh, downstairs indices match in the summation and in the left and right hand sides so we see that the index mu of the covariant derivative corresponds to mu the first downstairs index of the tensor field c and then uh, uh, the fixed index of the differentiated uh, uh, tensor field must go to the respective position new here is upstairs it also comes upstairs here now new here is downstairs it must go also here downstairs and then the free slots are the ones that are contracted uh, to give us uh, a nice equation So we can inductively apply the same uh, calculation for uh, tensor fields of uh, higher type, higher order, high rank, whatever. And uh, as an example here, consider a 1-1 one -one tensor field F. So in order to derive a similar formula, we consider the contraction of F with a one form field omega and a vector field X. That gives us a function. Again, the action of d minus d tilde on that function is equal to zero. We apply the Leibniz rule. Now we have three terms, one uh, with d minus d tilde acting on f, the other one acting on omega, and the other one acting on x. Now, from the previous step, we have already computed the action of d minus d tilde on uh, uh, lower rank tensor fields and we can substitute for them here and then the first term here has uh, the part of the equation that uh, we need uh, to calculate so we substitute for d minus d tilde acting on omega and on x with the formulas that we have derived before we take care of the signs and uh, we have uh, a minus coming from the one form, a plus coming from the uh, vector field here. And uh, in order to uh, compute the action of a tensor field on uh, uh, the one form field omega and uh, uh, vector field x, we have to rename the indices. Now we have dummy indices here, summed over, rho and sigma. We rename rho to be sigma here and sigma to be rho. And this way we have this omega x term having the same indices as in the first term. And here we rename nu to be sigma and the sigma to be nu. And then the omega x uh, term here has the same indices as the first and second term. So this can be factored out and uh, gives us the action of uh, uh, this tensor field on omega and x. And because these are arbitrary one forms and vectors, this tensor has to be equal to zero. So we can bring df uh, 
to the left hand side and everything else to the right hand side and derive this nice formula here and uh, you see that uh, uh, a very easy to recognize pattern arises when we take uh, the derivatives of high rank tensors we take its index in uh, uh, in any order we like we have to take all of them so every time we pick an upstairs index we put a plus sign here and uh, we put uh, 1 to tensor field C and uh, the index mu here has to match the index mu in the derivative there now uh, the index that we have uh, picked row here becomes the upstairs index in C and the free slots are used for the contraction then we take the other index since it is downstairs it is uh, we have a similar term as that for one forms we get a minus sign here mu and mu here is the same uh, new is the index that we have chosen and the free slots here are uh, chosen for the contraction so it is easy to see how this formula will generalize for any higher rank tensor fields so if we have a KL type tensor field uh, we have to write down a similar formula relating dt and d tilde t and uh, we have to add such terms one for each index of uh, the tensor field so uh, the first row here has the contractions with the upstairs indices of t now we, we take all the indices the one after the other we start from the first one we contract it with c the contracted index comes upstairs here in the tensor field C and we repeat that for all indices up to the last one nu kappa and then we start with the lower indices and uh, for each such index we add the term with a minus sign uh, the chosen index comes now here downstairs in uh, C and uh, we contract the empty slots and that is done for all the indices that are downstairs now in the special case where the derivative operator d tilde is the partial derivative defined in a specific coordinate system those uh, tensor field C have a special name given by the Greek letter capital Greek letter gamma so we use this notation where C is now denoted by gamma rho min e. so for example the action of d on x is the partial derivative of x plus now instead of c we have gamma gamma nimi rho x rho and similarly for one forms and now here we take care of the minus sign and you see also the formula for higher rank tensor fields is the same substituting uh, d tilde with the partial derivative and all the c's here with gammas note that uh, in the point of view that we have taken in this uh, video lecture gamma is a one to tensor fields expressing the difference between two different covariant derivative operators of course we remember that the partial derivative is defined in a specific coordinate system and if we have a different coordinate system x mu prime and uh, the covariant derivative operator in that coordinate system is partial derivative mu prime then we have a different one to tensor field gamma mu prime mu prime rho prime expressing the difference of uh, d with a partial derivative defined in the new coordinate system now let's look a little bit more into the torsion free property of the uh, derivative operator and how that translates to a property for the c's and gammas so we have defined uh, a covariant derivative to be torsion free 
if it satisfies this relation for any function f. Now, if we want to compute the first term, d mu d nu f, then for d nu here we can substitute d tilde nu because the action on functions for the two derivative operators is the same. Then d tilde f is a one form and uh, we can compute uh, the action of d on d tilde f in terms of the action of d tilde on that one form. And the difference is given by the tensor field C Romini. Now, if we do the same computation but reversing the orders of d mu and d nu, we have the same relation here, but now notice that the downstairs index indices of the tensor field C uh, is reversed. Instead of having mu nu here, we have nu mu. If d and d tilde are torsion free, both of them, then d mu d nu is equal to d nu d mu. And the same thing is true for the tilde uh, covariant derivative operator. And since those terms here are equal for those covariant derivatives, then those terms must also be equal. So C rho mini acting on d tilde f is equal to C rho nimi acting on d tilde f. And of course, because f is an arbitrary function, that means that uh, the tensor fields on the left-hand side and the right-hand side here are equal. And it proves that uh, for those two torsion-free derivative operators, their difference is given by this 1-2 tensor field, which is symmetric with respect to its two downstairs indices. And it also means, of course, that the anti-symmetric part of uh, this tensor field is equal to zero. Now, the partial derivative is uh, torsion-free by definition. So, if uh, a derivative operator is torsion-free, it means that the Christoffel symbols gamma are symmetric in uh, their two downstairs indices. If they are not torsion-free, then we can write down, as before, uh, the difference of those two terms in terms of the partial derivatives and the Christoffel symbols. And if we subtract, the right-hand side here contains the anti-symmetric part with respect to the two lower indi indices of the uh, tensor field gamma Romini. And uh, since this is a, a tensor field, we give it a special name and we call it the torsion of this derivative operator. So, as we have promised in the original slides, uh, this difference here is always a tensor field, trivial for torsion-free operators, but uh, for, any to for any derivative operator, uh, it defines a, a tensor field, a 1-2 tensor field, that is called the torsion. And uh, the torsion plays an important role in some theories. Now, Let's look a little bit at the relation of the Christoffel symbols in different coordinate systems. And for that, let's abandon for the moment the abstract index notation and work with components. Let's consider two different coordinate systems, with x mu and x mu prime, with charge u and u prime. Now, the derivative of a vector field v with respect to the uh, derivative operator, uh, d mu here, is a 1-1 tensor. Therefore, if, if we consider its components in those two different coordinate systems, they must be related with uh, the well-known uh, component transformation law for 1-1 tensors. If we compute the left-hand side, then this is equal to the partial derivative of uh, the components of V plus gamma multiplying v and to make this uh, linear transformation of the components. So you see here for given mu here we multiply with the matrix with two indices nu and lambda so that makes a linear transformation of uh, the vector field v at, the, at a given point. 
Now, if we substitute for the coordinates of uh, v in uh, u instead of u prime, uh, we have this term here inside the derivative. The, der the partial derivative is acting on this product here. And uh, v lambda prime here is substituted by dx prime by dx times v lambda. We also change with the ordinary chain rule known from analysis uh, the partial derivatives d mu prime with the partial derivatives d mu. So we do some uh, simple algebra here. The Leibniz rule of d mu acting on this product will give us those two terms shown here. And uh, it is noticeable that uh, uh, when uh, d is acting on the first term here, it gives us something that has the second derivatives of the x prime coordinates with respect to the x. Now, all the other terms are transforming linearly. Uh, and let's compare this result to what is uh, on the right hand side of this equation. So we substitute dv here by this expression here involving the Christoffel symbols. And uh, we obtain those two terms. And uh, if we equate those two terms, we see that this term with this term cancels. And uh, we also rename the index new here, the dummy index new. We rename it and write, writing change its name to lambda. And we obtain uh, this equation here. Now, this equation here is valid for any uh, vector field, V. So uh, we assume that uh, You see, if, if this term acts linear on v and it is equal to 0, then this is equal to 0. So we obtain this equation in the second row here uh, without v. And now our goal is to solve for gamma in terms of gamma prime. So in order to do this, we multiply by inverse matrices. So we want to get rid of this product here. So we multiply by dx mu prime by dx rho. So we sum mu prime here with mu prime. And the inverse of this, and uh, we sum over nu prime here and nu prime there. So because those matrices are uh, inverse to each other, we obtain uh, uh, Kronecker deltas for the indices that are not summed over. So you see, when we multiply this with this, we have a delta mu rho. And when we multiply this with that, a uh, new prime is summed over. So we have leftover indices nu and sigma that gives us this delta chronicle. Now, on the left hand side, we also have a simplification because we multiply uh, here with uh, So I had to correct a small error here. There's no second derivative here. So this will give us this uh, delta mu rho shown here. So we are left over with the terms shown here. And the right hand side has gamma sigma rho lambda. So let's uh, rename sigma to nu and rho to mu and obtain an equation for gamma uh, ni mi lambda in terms of gamma ni prime mi prime lambda prime. So you see the first term here has uh, resembles the, uh, the way that uh, the components of a 1 to tensor transforms but uh, we have this second term here showing that uh, uh, this is not enough. And we have to add this term that spoils 
this uh, tensor-like uh, component uh, transformation. Of course, we can uh, reverse this equation by naming uh, new mu lambda to be new prime mu prime lambda prime, and we have a similar equation giving us gamma prime in terms of gamma. Now, be careful that this equations here uh, relates the components of uh, uh, gamma in different coordinate system. So we have, uh, let's say we define the one to tensor field gamma ni mi lambda and uh, uh, giving us uh, the difference between d and the partial derivative and uh, uh, that gives us the components in that coordinate system then uh, if we take uh, the derivative operator uh, with respect to a different coordinate system and we have a different gamma here coming from that uh, different partial derivative then the components of gamma uh, of that different uh, partial derivative with respect to the original one must be related according to this law. But gammas and gamma primes are tensor fields, but in different coordinate systems, they are not related, the components are not related as those of the same tensor field. So this is slightly confusing, so let's do an exercise to compute the difference of d minus d tilde on the vector field. And uh, since uh, we, had, we have defined the partial derivatives to be uh, ordinary covariant derivatives, their difference here must also be a tensor field C, which we will now compute. So let's make the notation a, a little bit more explicit. The mu v nu is the 1 1 tensor field in abstract notation, but it is the one that in the chart u has components d alpha v beta. So alpha beta will denote the components, mu and nu are the abstract indices in this exercise. So uh, d and d tilde act on a different way on, uh, on a tensor field, giving us a different 1 1 tensor field. So let's stay in the uh, intersection of the two charts, u intersection u tilde, which we assume, of course, to be uh, non-empty. Now, the components of uh, uh, dv, the first tensor field, which is defined in u, in the coordinate system u tilde are uh, given by uh, this relation here. So, if we act with uh, uh, So the, the components of d tilde here, yes, are uh, transforming in this way between the two different coordinate systems. So uh, v, the components of v in the tilde coordinate system is related to the components of v in the u chart with uh, this transformation law, and uh, uh, the derivative with respect to x can be inserted here with the chain rule. So we have those two different terms coming from uh, the Leibniz rule for ordinary partial derivatives. Now, d tilde v is a tensor, and the components of that tensor in uh, any coordinate system must transform according to the 1-1 uh, tensor transformation law. So if we have the components of d tilde v, which are by definition given by the partial derivatives of the components alpha tilde, beta tilde here. In the coordinate system u, the components are given by the transformation law shown here. So uh, we substitute what we have found above for uh, the components the alpha tilde v beta tilde by this here, 
and uh, we notice some simplifications because we multiply by inverse matrices. So you see this index here and that index here are summed over, giving us delta alpha gamma. Uh, the indices here are summed over here, vita and vita, our dummy is the dummy index, leaving us with delta vita gamma. And similarly here, uh, the alpha index is a dummy index giving us alpha gamma uh, to be free, resulting in a delta alpha gamma uh, Kronecker delta. So the D tilde V has components in the U coordinate system that are related to the components of DV in the same coordinate system with this transformation law. So if we bring those two terms to the left hand side, we see that the difference is the term shown here. So, in uh, uh, the difference of the two uh, derivative operators here is given by this one two tensor field, which can be written in a simple way in uh, the chart U according to this relation here. Now, let's discuss now what we mean by a derivative operator to be compatible with a given metric. We define uh, a covariant derivative to be compatible with a metric G if it leaves G invariant, which means that the derivative of G with respect to that operator is equal to zero. We will soon see that this is a very useful uh, definition because uh, metric compatibility implies that the inner product of parallelly transported vectors uh, is uh, preserved. We will see also that uh, there is a unique derivative operator that is metric compatible and torsion free. The proof is very easy and uh, we will do it because uh, we will also understand why this is true. So let d tilde be any torsion free derivative operator. Then since d is metric compatible with g, it means that dg is equal to zero. And if we compute this uh, covariant derivative in terms of d tilde, we obtain this result here because uh, we have two indices here, two downstairs indices, so we have two terms, one for each index of the metric uh, G. Now because uh, we have assumed that uh, D is torsion free, uh, the tensor C here is symmetric with respect to its two downstairs indices. Now we apply uh, this formula for uh, all cyclic permutations of the indices mi, ni, and rho. So we write the equation uh, with mi, ni, rho, as we have started with, then we put mi, ni, rho, and then mi, ni, rho, and uh, we have three different equations here, and uh, uh, we write uh, the respective right-hand sides, taking care of the indices to be placed in the c their correct uh, positions. Now, what we do is we add those equations after we have changed the sign of the first one. So, uh, on the left hand side, we obtain d mi g ni rho, d rho j mi ni plus d ni g rho mi. And then you see that because of the torsion free property of the derivative operator, there are many cancellations. This term and this term cancels because you see it only differs here. You have mi rho rho mi, so those two terms are the same, they come with different signs, so they cancel out, and this term with that term are the same, we have mi ni here and ni mi there, so because of the symmetry property those two terms are equal and they vanish. So we are left with those two terms, they o only differ in uh, the order of the indices, uh, ni and rho, so they are equal to each other, 
So we obtain two times uh, this term here. So if we want to solve for C, we multiply by uh, the inverse matrix. Uh, you see here we contract this index with that one so that we can obtain uh, Kronecker delta, delta lambda sigma. So that will uh, make the lambda index to be equal to sigma here. And the result is this equation there. So we can express the tensor field C in terms of uh, G and its derivatives with respect to the covariant derivative D tilde. Now if we pick a particular coordinate system and uh, we choose the uh, derivative operator D tilde to be the partial derivative, then instead of C we have the Christopher symbols gamma. So the corresponding formula for this choice is the same as this one where we substitute D tilde for the partial derivatives. Now we will use this formula quite a lot in this class so it is good to find a way to memorize it. So we have three terms here with plus plus and minus sign. Uh, notice that the minus sign here corresponds to the term that has ni rho here which is the two downstairs indices of the Christopher symbol in uh, the left hand side and then the other two terms have uh, in uh, uh, succession the two indices ni and rho to be the indices in the partial derivative operator so we have the ni and the rho so that leaves us only one choice on what to do with the rest of the indices in, uh, in G. And then we have to multiply with the inverse matrix of uh, G so that we have the index upstairs on the left hand side. So uh, such a connection that is defined by this relation here is the unique connection associated with the metric which is called the Christoffel connection or the levi civita uh, connection. And this is the one that we will use in uh, general relativity. Notice some interesting properties that uh, such a connection has. First of all, if we are in a freely falling inertial frame, we know that in that frame we can pick coordinates where the derivative of g is equal to zero. Therefore, in those coordinates the Christoffel symbols vanish and the covariant derivative is the same, has the same action as the partial derivative. Of course, this is true only for one particular point where the inertial frame uh, is defined. Now, this is very important because of the equivalence principle uh, we, what we usually do is we uh, sit down, pick a, an inertial frame, take uh, formulas that uh, we have computed in special relativity. This will involve uh, derivatives of tensor fields, ordinary derivatives. So we can uh, generalize those equations by replacing the partial derivative with the covariant derivative and uh, postulate that this equation is valid uh, everywhere on the manifold. Furthermore, the invariance of G with respect to the derivative operator implies that also the volume element uh, defined by the levi civita tensor that we discussed in a previous uh, video is also invariant under the action of uh, the metric uh, compatible covariant derivative operator. So we will soon see that this means that the volume element is invariant under parallel transport along a curve uh, for parallel transport defined by metric compatible uh, covariant derivative. And of course, if uh, dg is equal to zero, then d of the inverse g is also equal to zero. Now let's take a break and uh, uh, work out a simple exercise that will give us a very useful formula that we can use to simplify equations 
and also uh, it is a very useful equation when we use it uh, uh, together with uh, Stokes theorem. So uh, the exercise says that um, the divergence of a vector field with respect to a chosen derivative operator, which is of course metric compatible with the metric G, is given in terms of the determinant of G and uh, a simple derivative of uh, uh, square root of G times V. And notice that square root of G is uh, the factor that uh, comes from the uh, volume element. In order to prove this equation, let's prove first a very useful formula that we will use a lot in this class. And uh, let's consider an arbitrary variation of the determinant of a metric and show that this is equal to, that th this is related to the variation of the components of the metric according to this, to this formula here. And uh, furthermore, we will show that if we know the variation the variations of the components of the inverse metric, we obtain a similar formula but with a minus sign here, which is very important. So uh, this formula is particularly uh, useful when we will do uh, calculus of variations uh, with respect to varying actions in general relativity, but uh, a partial derivative is a special kind of variation, so it will turn out to be useful in this exercise as well. So uh, this formula also implies that the variation of the square root of the absolute value of the determinant is given by this formula here in a trivial way. So let's use a temporary notation just for the next few slides. Instead of uh, denoting uh, the determinant of G by the letter G, let's for the moment denote the matrix G uh, composed of the components of uh, G in a given coordinate system. So G now is a matrix and this matrix can be diagonalized, it's a symmetric matrix which is non-degenerate, there's no difficulty in diagonalizing it and compute its uh, four uh, non-zero eigenvalues G mu. Then the determinant of uh, this matrix is simply the product of its eigenvalues and the trace which is also invariant under the process of uh, diagonalization is just the sum of those eigenvalues. And uh, if we take uh, the logarithm of uh, the matrix and then take its trace, then uh, this is also invariant under the diagonalization process and uh, it is equal to the sum of the, logarithm of, of the logarithms of the eigenvalue. So this is uh, linear algebra and uh, we will take those formulas for granted. Just look at your linear algebra books for their proof. So, if the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, the logarithm of the determinant is the logarithm of the product, which is the sum of the logarithms, and the sum of lo the logarithms is just, just the trace of the logarithm of G. So, the determinant of G is E to the trace of log G. So, if we vary the determinant, it is equivalent to varying the right-hand side here. So we obtain e to the trace ln g times the variation of the exponent, which is just the trace of a matrix. Now the exponent, the exponential here is the determinant of g. And uh, the variation here now can be written as, uh, since this is a number here, it's not a matrix, uh, a variation of the sums of the logarithms of the eigenvalues. And such a variation of logarithms is just given a, as the sum of delta g mu over g mu. And we see that by uh, uh, diagonalizing g minus 1 dg and uh, noting that the trace is, is invariant under the diagonalization process, that this sum here is nothing but the trace of g minus 1 times delta g, where g minus 1 and delta g are uh, the matrices there. 
So, uh, the trace of g minus 1 dg is nothing but g mu nu times delta g mu nu times the determinant of g. Now, let's write this also in terms of uh, the variation of uh, the components of the inverse matrix. We notice that uh, this is the definition of the inverse matrix that defines g mu rho upstairs. And if we vary this equation, the right hand side is equal to zero. This is constant with respect to the variation. And the left hand side gives us two terms by applying the Leibniz rule. And we see why the minus sign comes here relating the variations of uh, the inverse matrix with respect to the variation of the metric. So let's abandon the new notation to the old one and now let's denote uh, the determinant of G by the letter G as we did before the proof of those uh, equations. So the variation of the determinant of G is the determinant of G G mu nu delta G mu or minus G G mu nu downstairs delta G mu nu upstairs. And that gives us the corresponding formula for the variation of the square root to be equal to this one. So if we consider the partial derivative as a special variation here, so we substitute uh, d lambda wherever we see delta. So d lambda of the square root of g is one half square root of g, g mu nu, d lambda, g mu nu. So the derivative of the square root of the determinant divided by the square root of the determinant is given by one half g mu nu delta lambda g mu nu. Now we can compute the left hand side. We use uh, the formula for uh, the covariant derivative, but now we contract the indices here. So we see mu and mu here, and mu and mu there are contracted. Now, this is the formula for the Christoffel symbols here. And uh, we contract the sigma and mu indices, and we obtain this equation there. Now, notice that after the contraction, this term here is symmetric with respect to the change of mu and rho. Sorry, not mu and g, mu and rho. So, we can rename rho and mu here and write it mu and rho, like we have done here. And the reason we did this is that after this uh, change of names of indices, we see that this term and that term are equal and they cancel. So all we are left with is this term here. But this term here is nothing but the right hand side of this equation and we can substitute for it. So this is equal to 1 over square root of g, d lambda square root of g. Then we can go back to this equation and substitute for the uh, derivative of the square root of the determin determinant. But after we factor out 1 over square root of g, we see that those terms here are nothing but the derivative of the product of square root of g and p mu. So we have proven the equation in, uh, uh, of uh, the exercise. So now let's use uh, a derivative operator to define what we mean by a directional covariant derivative. In many textbooks, one starts from defining as a covariant derivative what we call now the directional covariant derivative and then go ahead and define what we have defined as the uh, derivative operator d mu. So let's consider a curve on uh, which uh, a vector field V is tangent to all of its points. That means gamma is one of its integral curves. And then uh, if we have a vector field W, which is also defined uh, on all points of that curve, 
we define the covariant derivative of w on the curve gamma or the directional covariant derivative uh, of w with uh, respect to v to be the contraction of d nu of w mu with the uh, vector field v nu. Sometimes we write uh, uh, the left hand side as uh, dw by dt where t is the parameter uh, that uh, defines the curve. Now notice that from the uh, properties that we have postulated for the uh, derivative operator the new, the following properties uh, also hold for the directional derivative. Property 1 tells us that it acts linearly on uh, linear, linear combinations of uh, vector fields w and u alpha and beta are real numbers and uh, the Leibniz rule applies when a function f multiplies a vector field w uh, property 3 says that if we take the directional derivative of w in a curve that has a tangent vector fv plus gu then uh, the result is the linear combination of the respective directional derivatives Notice that this property is trivial with the definition that we have uh, given to the directional derivative because if you uh, see the uh, fv plus gu here is uh, contracted with uh, d and uh, of course this is uh, a linear operation. We also notice that uh, the action of the directional covariant derivative on functions is the same as the action of the vector field v on that function. The covariant derivative obeys uh, a Leibniz uh, product uh, uh, property with respect to tensor products as shown here, equation 5. Uh, it has, uh, uh, if we take contractions of uh, vector fields with uh, one forms then we have uh, this property holding here and that will allow us to compute as we have done for the uh, covariant derivative d mu the action of dv on uh, higher order uh, tensor fields higher rank tensor fields and uh, the torsion free uh, condition is now translated uh, in this equation here and go back to slide number 7 uh, rolling back this video to see that that uh, this is uh, the property that we have uh, computed when we started discussing uh, derivative operators and we had shown that this is the same as the uh, commutator of the vector fields v w acting on any function To make uh, the definition explicit, uh, the derivative of v with respect uh, of w with respect to v can be written in terms of the uh, Christoffel symbols here, this way. And uh, if x mu are the coordinates that correspond uh, to those Christoffel symbols, then the components of uh, uh, the vector field v uh, are equal to the rate of change of the coordinates as we move along the curve dx mu by dt so uh, we can substitute those derivatives here for the components of v and obtain this equation here now notice that this is the total derivative of w if we make it a function of t and uh, that makes this equation to depend only on the values of w on the curve and not on its uh, neighboring values that means all tensor fields that have equal values on a curve have also the same directional derivative the directional derivative allows us to define parallel transport so let's see what we mean by tra parallel transporting a vector along a curve. So we have the curve as before, uh, v is 
the tangent on that curve at each point. So a vector field W defined on all points of curve is uh, uh, defined to be parallel transported along that curve if its directional derivative is zero for all points of that curve. And uh, if we write this condition in terms of uh, the expression that we had uh, shown in the previous slide here, this one, then we have this equation here that the components of W must satisfy uh, in a chart in the neighborhood of P. So this is a first order differential equation for W and we see that if the vector field uh, W has a given value at the point P, this defines a unique uh, series of vectors along the curve that are parallel transported along gamma. And that makes, uh, gives us a one-to-one -one map between tangent, spo tangent spaces uh, along uh, 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 between tangent spaces at points on the curve that are different. So if P and Q are two different points on the curve, then, uh, then we have a one-to-one -one map between uh, vectors uh, in uh, the tangent space at P and the tangent space at Q. And uh, this map maps vectors at the tangent uh, space at P to parallel transported vectors along the curve in the tangent space at the point Q. So this is true for any value of the parameter t, even infinitesimally close to the uh, parameter t0 that gives us the point P. So we have a one parameter family of uh, diffeomorphisms that uh, uh, maps in a continuous and differentiable way uh, vectors uh, between uh, tangent spaces at the different points on the curve. So now uh, what we also see from this equation is that parallel transport is path dependent. That means that if we take a different curve that starts from P and uh, go through the point Q, then uh, uh, parallel transported vectors along that different curve will in general be different than the ones that are parallel transported al along the original curve. And we will uh, see in uh, when we will discuss curvature that uh, when we have a manifold where uh, curvature is not zero, this is uh, unavoidable. And always different uh, curves uh, will uh, result in uh, uh, different parallel transported vectors. Of course, parallel transport is connection dependent. If we choose a different connection as the one that defines the parallel transport, of course, we will obtain uh, different vectors to be parallel transported along the curve. Now, if the directional derivative is defined through a metric compatible derivative operator d mu, then uh, if we consider the contraction of that metric with two different uh, vector fields, w and u, uh, then we obtain this result shown here. Now, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the inner product of the two vectors. The contraction of g with the, those two vectors is what we call the inner product of uh, the vector fields, w and u. Now, since this is a function, the rate of change of that function along the curve is equal to the, its directional derivative. And then if we apply the Leibniz rule on the product uh, g, w, u, we obtain those three terms shown here. So the first term is identically equal to zero because we have assumed that d is metric compatible. So the metric is left invariant under the action of uh, uh, of the covariant derivative d. 
Now, if W and U are parallel transported along the curve, then dVw and dVu are also equal to zero. So we see that the rate of change of the inner product of the two vectors along the curve is equal to zero. That means that it remains constant as we move along the curve. So parallel transported vectors have angles that are preserved and also their norms are preserved. And these are properties that uh, we are familiar with ordinary parallel transport in flat space. So these proper those properties are carried over to parallel transport in curved spaces, but that's the best that uh, we can do. And for example, we cannot avoid having a path-dependent parallel transport. Parallel transport is defined in a similar way for a tensor of any type. If we have a KL tensor T, we suppress the indices here because they don't matter in those equations, then the directional derivative of T with, uh, in the direction of V is nothing but the contraction of d mu T with uh, the vector field V. And uh, we define T to be parallel transported along uh, the curve gamma, where v is uh, its tangent, tangent vector at all, at all its points, if dvt is equal to zero at all the points of the curve. So this gives us also an intuitive understanding of what the covariant derivative is. So if a tensor field that is parallel transported has uh, a covariant derivative that is equal to zero, that is that means to be left invariant in some sense, then uh, non-zero uh, covariant derivatives gives us the rate of change of t compared to what it would be, would have been if uh, t was parallel transported. So we have seen that if we have a covariant derivative, we can define parallel transport. But in fact, for torsion-free uh, connections, uh, if we define parallel transport, that also defines a covariant derivative in uh, the manifold. And we, to show that uh, this gives us a general covariant derivative, we will show that it defines a directional covariant derivative. So let's assume that we know how to parallel transport uh, uh, vectors along any curve. That means that if we have a curve, gamma with a parameter t, then uh, if we have a vector defined along the curve, wt0 is its value at p and wt is its value at q, then we know how to parallel transport wt from q back to p. So wt is mapped to a vector at the point p, which we denote by tau tt0 w of t. And that is a vector in the tangent space at the point P. So this is the vector here with the color red. And now, since we have brought uh, WT parallel transported back to P, we can compare it to the value of W at the point P. Now, uh, this comparison is done by computing this difference. And uh, this difference can be computed for points Q that are infinitesimally close to the point P, and that will uh, lead us to the definition of a covariant derivative uh, using a formula like this one. Now, uh, this is just a definition, and uh, if we want uh, this derivative to, has to have the properties of a covariant derivative, we have to make some assumptions of uh, the properties that this parallel transport must have. First of all, the parallel transport of uh, a vector multiplied by a function uh, from uh, over a finite distance over the curve must be f times the parallel transport of uh, the vector. And also, the parallel transport of uh, the sum of two vectors should be the sum of the parallel transported vectors. So, those two properties, uh, if they are substituted here in uh, the definition of the covariant derivative, 
will give us uh, those properties that we have uh, shown to be valid uh, for the direction derivative defined in terms of a known derivative operator. But now, this is a property that comes from the parallel transport and this definition here. So it acts linearly on linear combinations of uh, vectors and uh, the Leibniz rule applies for f times w, on f times w. We also require the parallel transport to be a geometric property, therefore we require that it is reparametrization invariant or parametrization independent. That means that parallel transport depends on the points P and Q and not on the uh, rate of change of things as we move along the curve. So if we parallel transport W along the curve from Q to P and uh, we use T as the parameter, the results should be the same if we move at a different rate using the parameter T prime. So Q here corresponds to the parameter T prime and T respectively. Then we know that the tangent pe vector of the curve gamma when the parameter is T prime is D by DT prime and is related to the tangent vector of uh, the same geometric curve but with parameter T uh, which is D by DT by a function f multiplying v and this function is nothing but the rate of change of t with respect to t prime. So if we uh, apply the definition of the directional derivative uh, using the parameter t prime this is uh, the formula that gives us this uh, derivative and uh, because uh, this term here is uh, parametrization independent. We can uh, substitute here for t instead of t prime. And then we can uh, multiply and divide by t minus t0. And of course that will give us uh, the derivative of w with respect to v multiplied by the derivative dt by dt prime. So that tells us that the directional derivative of f times v on w is f dvw, which is a property that we require for covariant derivatives. We also want to show that the derivative of u along a curve defined by the tangent vectors v plus w is equal to the sum of uh, the respective covariant derivatives with respect to v and w. And in order to show that, remember that we have shown that if we have a torsion-free derivative operator, something that we require here, then dvw minus dwv is equal to the commutator of the two vector fields. So uh, if we request that parallel transport gives us a torsion-free dv, then this equation must be valid. And we see, you see here we put v plus w, v plus w and v plus w. Now we have already proved that uh, uh, d on v plus w is d on v plus d on w. But we also show that, uh, we also know that uh, if we take the commutator then this is uh, linear with respect to its first slot. So the right hand side is the sum VU and WU. But now we can substitute uh, the expressions with respect to the derivatives for the commutators according to this relation here. So we have this and this term coming from the respective commutators. And then several cancellations take place. This term is the same as this one, and this term is the same as that one. Therefore, dv plus w is dvu plus dwu. Uh, 